You know, it, in the Old Testament, occasionally we will get these stories uh, where a, a woman of faith is the central character. And uh, generally, they're pretty inspiring stories. Uh, some of them uh, are a little more uh, military, right? If you like uh, kind of battle scenes and that, especially in the early part of the Old Testament. But uh, this story is a story of just a woman who perseveres in the midst of stuff. And I think uh, it's a great inspiring story of Hannah in the Old Testament. So I, I want to share it. When we get those stories, I want to... Um, I like preaching on them because uh, they're good stories to highlight as we persevere in faith in the midst of stuff, right? We can all relate to that. Uh, our stuff might be different from Hannah's, but we all got stuff. So Hannah is the wife of Elkanah, and Elkanah has two wives. And in the Old Testament, that happens. Um, it's never really held up as the ideal. You know, some people wonder about the Bible in the Old Testament and does the Bible condone having multiple wives? It never really does, but it just tells the story kind of culturally of, of that practice. And by the time uh, Jesus's day comes around, it's pretty much not happening anymore in Judaism, but this is about a thousand years, 1100 years before Jesus. And uh, it's still in practice for those who could afford to do it. And that was kind of the big thing. Could you afford to take care of uh, a household with, you know, two wives and multiple children? And if you could, uh, culturally, it was accepted 1,100 years before Christ. So this is a story of, a, of Elkanah and his two wives. And uh, in the Bible, when, when it tells the story of a household with two wives, it's never really like everyone gets along. I mean, there's, it's always a mess. It's always a mess. And this is no... Exception. Elkanah has a favorite wife, Hannah. Uh, Elkanah has another wife, uh, Paniah, and Paniah is the one that can have all the kids. Hannah is unable to have children. Uh, Paniah can have kids. But Elkanah loves Hannah more, but um, Hannah constantly gets um, harassed by Paniah about her inability to have children. And in those days, especially, I mean, that was a hard thing for a woman to bear. And there would be thoughts, you know, by people in those days that it was a punishment of sorts for something a woman had done, right? A sin a woman had done or her parents had done. Um, they didn't understand medically the things we understand today. So they just thought, well, something, someone's being punished for something. And so even though Hannah may have had a, a, a very uh, upstanding reputation, she would know that when she would go in public places, there would still be people who would kind of, oh, yeah, that's Hannah, right? The one that can't have kids, something must be wrong with her, right? Not fair, but just kind of the, the, the way her society worked in that time. And it was a heavy wound on her heart. It was a heavy burden on her heart. And she dealt with it year after year, our story says. Uh, year after year. And so Hannah and her husband, Elkanah, is bringing the household up um, to worship for uh, a religious festival. So they're going to where the Ark of the Covenant is and the tabernacle. We, we don't have the temple building built yet, but the Ark would be kind of in a, a makeshift place. And so people would go there and, and celebrate feast days uh, and Jewish religious festivals. And so Elkanah is bringing his two wives and, and his family up um, for the festival. And uh, they're having feast. And her heart is heavy because she has this burden and, on her heart. And Elkanah tries, right, in his best kind of bumbling husband way to be sensitive and, and comfort her. But Elkanah, the best he can do is, um, hey, you got me, right? which every wife knows immediately makes, uh, makes everything better, right? It's kind of like, aren't you, you're, you're pretty lucky you have me as a husband, right? I mean, that, that makes up for it, doesn't it? Uh, Elkanah tries, right? We can say for, an, uh, for a husband in 1100 BC, he's trying, he's trying, but that just doesn't seem to do it. And you can understand why. He, his actual quote is, am I not more to you than 10 sons? Isn't one me better than 10 sons? 
maybe he had a little bit of an ego. I don't know. What do you think? You can, you can be the judge of that. But that didn't make her feel any better. Her heart was still heavy as she carried this burden. And so she went to church. She went to, to uh, the, the area that was set up around the Ark of the Covenant. Um, they, they're calling it the temple area. It's not the temple that we think of, you know, in Jesus' time. That's this big, huge structure. But it was kind of the makeshift temple that would be set up around the Ark. And uh, she went to pray. So her husband wasn't helpful, but maybe the priest would be more helpful. And she's praying in church, just quiet to herself, not trying to bother anyone. And uh, she's moving her lips, but not saying the words out loud. If you've ever seen, um, you, you know, that's the way a lot of us pray, right? My grandmother uh, used to pray like that uh, all the time. But then when she lost her hearing, she, she still thought she wasn't saying anything out loud, but she was. And so we would just hear her start breaking into prayer in the middle of like, uh, you know, a conversation that she didn't like the direction it was going in. It's kind of like a neat thing of, for a person of faith to do when you think about it, but it was always awkward. You know, it's, it would just be in the middle of a conversation and she'd just start whispering prayers, right? But they were in, in the, the only God could hear and everyone else in the room. Um, but but uh, Hannah is praying in that way. Uh, in the in the back of the temple, so she's sitting by the doorpost. So um, she's sitting uh, as far back as she could, trying not to bother anyone. Just her lips are moving, and she's not saying anything. But it gives us an idea of what she's praying, and it's a type of prayer that maybe you know. Uh, I know it. It's a prayer that goes something like this: Oh Lord, if you would just do this, I promise I'll do this. Right? I don't know if you've ever prayed that type of prayer before. God, if you would just do this, I promise I will never complain about blank again. Right? Wh whatever that prayer is. And her prayer is, Lord, if you would just give me a son, I'll give him back to you. That's what she's saying. If you just give me a son, I'll give him back to you. She says, I'll make him a Nazarite. A Nazarite is a, a vow that a man would take to dedicate themselves to God for a period of time. But sometimes, in rare occasions, someone would be a Nazarite for life. John the Baptist is a very famous one. He was a Nazarite for life. His parents said, from birth, you will be dedicated to God. And it was marked by not cutting your hair, not shaving your beard, um, not drinking alcohol. Those were the three things of a Nazarite. That, so you knew in public they were Nazarites because they wouldn't partake in alcohol. They had huge beards, long hair. And so she's saying, Lord, if you just give me a son, I'll give him right back to you. He'll be a Nazarite. And she's praying and the priest comes over to be super helpful. And he tries to kick her out of the church for being drunk which is not really what she needed. Now, I've been a priest long enough that I have seen drunk people in church, both during a Sunday service and during the week. Never have they just come in to pray. Like, that's usually not what happens. I would, that wouldn't be my first uh, tell. But uh, the priest, Eli, thought she was drunk. Um, he told her to go back and stop drinking wine. And she explains to him, no, I'm not drunk. I'm, I've got this burden on my heart that is heavy. She doesn't tell him what it is. And I'm just crying out to the Lord because I don't know who else, where else to go. And he feels bad and uh, tells her, okay, keep praying. The Lord, may the Lord bless you and grant you the, the petition that you're making. And Hannah uh, goes home and she feels encouraged by that, right? That's, that's oddly encouraging from the, from the priest. Uh, she, she goes home, her heart is uh, lifted a bit, her spirits are lifted. And she goes back to her family. And this is what it says. In due time, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel. For she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Uh, in due time. So the Lord heard her prayers. This, this, this woman who had this burden on her heart for this thing, for her it was uh, being the wife that didn't have a child. She cried out to the Lord consistently over time. Uh, and in due time, the Lord heard her prayers. Even though she had a husband that maybe wasn't the most sensitive to about it. Um, the, she had a priest that maybe at the, at the beginning wasn't the most helpful or pastoral about it. But Hannah cried out to God and God heard her. It says the Lord remembered her. And in due time, she bore a son named Samuel. 
Uh, this is the beginning of the story of Samuel, the great priest and prophet of Israel. Now, there's just a couple things that can encourage us from this story, probably more than a couple, but uh, one is uh, perseverance of prayer. And we see Hannah. Uh, th this is what it's like for most of us. We read stories in the Bible of, of, of the blind being, having their eyes open, the deaf hearing, Jesus kind of doing this immediate thing. But for most of us, most of the time, most of our life, it's a perseverance of prayer over the course of time, right? We carry these things with us and we persevere. Hannah dealt with her situation of being childless for several years and she kept this, she had this burden on her heart that she kept bringing to the Lord. And then it even says to have, have a child, it says in due time, right? We're all living on the Lord's definition of in due time which sometimes is very different from our definition of in due time. Right? Sometimes it's very different from our definition of what happens in due time. But Hannah put her trust in, in the Lord, even though the Lord's definition of in due time wasn't what she had planned, wasn't what she maybe thought was made sense to her, she put her trust in him. And in due time, the Lord heard her prayer. So perseverance in prayer. And bringing before the Lord that burden that we might carry. That thing on our heart that we don't want to talk to other people about. That maybe wounds us or that maybe we've been wounded by. That we carry, that we think about, that we feel the weight of. Um, to bring that before the Lord, uh, trusting him to lift it. And, uh, you know, I've, we, we've, I've shared you know, my story of my uh, issues with my dad and the burden that that was in my life till I, till God took that from me. I was willing to give that to him and he took it. Um, you know, Sarah and I have been open about our stories of being childless for seven years uh, before we were married and the burden that was on our heart. I mean, I, I can under, I have a perspective on the story that maybe is a little different than most because of, of things we live through and certainly my wife would as well. Uh, and seeing other people kind of carry those burdens as a priest, you know, through the years, not wanting to talk about them, not wanting to share about them, being a little too sensitive, but those things we carry that only God can lift if we turn to him. And I saw this past uh, weekend, I was in Florida with our family, and we saw uh, another uh, a relative that was dealing with a father son that weren't speaking to each other. And it was heartbreaking for the father. Heartbreaking for the father. I could tell you the burden on his heart when he goes to church by himself uh, and prays. I, I, I could tell you what the burden is. Right? We all carry burdens. Some of them aren't quite that degree, but we all carry those things that are private, are painful, that wound us or that wounded us, and, and that we need lifted. And so I would encourage you to see Hannah's story as a great um, encouraging story for you, right? To lift those things up to the Lord with perseverance and prayer, knowing that he can lift them like he did for Hannah. You know, our psalm today wasn't a psalm. It was a canticle from um, Samuel. It was Hannah's song. And Hannah is Hannah in this story, and it's after Samuel is born, she is bursting with joy because the Lord has lifted this weight and this burden that's been on her for years. And you can just, if you've ever been around someone that they're just so full of joy, they're kind of light as a feather, right? They're just in, in that place. That's where Hannah is, right? The Lord, when we turn to him with that thing, that private burden we carry in our heart, whatever it might be, he can lift it. So I would encourage you to see Hannah as hope for you if you're carrying one of those burdens today. Uh, that turn it over to him and the Lord will remember you. Uh, the Lord will remember you as he remembered Hannah and lift that burden. He's the only one that can. Trust in him and in due time, he can set you free from it. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.